All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join our webinar. Very happy to have you here with us. Um, we're excited to talk to you today about um, virtual pump design, more so in relation to NXCAD and NXCAM. Um, that's what we're going to be going over today on our end. So just so you're aware, uh, this will be an interactive webinar where we will have short polling questions throughout. So we look forward to your input. However, if you have questions that come up as we go through the presentation, um, please go ahead and ask them in the question feature and we will aim to address them at the end of the webinar or by email if we run out of time. Please also note that the presentation material will be shared by email as well. Great. Andy, could you go next? Wonderful. So my name is uh, Daniel Mazar. I'm responsible for customer success and sales for Maya North America, and I will be your host for this webinar. Joining me and running the majority of the webinar is my colleague, Andy Schaefers. Andy is a senior application engineer, previously with uh, Acuity and now part of the, the Maya organization with the recent acquisition. He's one of the uh, foremost authorities when it comes to NX CAD CAM, and he will be presenting the majority of this presentation today. So we're excited to bring our expertise in, in leveraging in our engineering backgrounds and, and know-how um, in solving the complex challenges associated uh, with CAD CAM. If you can go ahead next, Andy. Great. Um, so this webinar today is the third in, in an engineering innovation series that's been ongoing uh, for a few weeks now. So, so we've actually done a couple other presentations. Uh, firstly, on just overview in terms of rotating machineries and pumps and, and talking more on design and giving more so a holistic picture. We did a, a follow-up one on systems and, and CAE simulation. Um, and again, today we'll talk more about digital manufacturing, but these are all available. Um, on on demand through our website. If you'd like, if you're interested in learning more about them, you can check out our website, or you could also just uh, put a note in the comments, and, and we'll be sure to circle back. Great, and Andy, if you can go next. Wonderful. As I mentioned, both Andy and I are part of uh, Maya HDT. So just to give you an idea as to who we are, Maya is a leading provider of digital engineering solutions and the number one global partner for Siemens digital industry software. Our history and our background is more in aerospace, but we we have uh, been working with uh, you know rotating machineries and pumps for over 30 years and in, in, in many different industries and various applications. Uh, so while we did start more so in aerospace, it's, it's expanded beyond to, to, to quite a few different areas. Um, as well as with our organization, where we have presence in US, UK, and Canada, but customers around the globe. If you just go next, Andy. Today, we're, we're covering just a small subset of, of what we do and, and how we operate in terms of just digital manufacturing, but there's, there's quite a bit in terms of our expertise beyond what was shared in the previous slides. And this is just to give you a snippet. I know it's not gonna be the focus of the presentation today, um, but, you know, if, if you have areas where you'd like more information, whether it's automation, optimization, or, for example, an area that, that's seeing quite a bit of intrigue nowadays is industrial Internet of Things, applied AI type applications, where we're, we're capturing data related to, let's say, a pump in the field and then turning that into information, or not just in the field, even as part of product development, um, as we're going through some quality assurance processes. So, so there's, there's a few quite a few different areas in which we cover and, and we get traction interest from. We also have on-demand and, and quite a bit of um, information available through webinars and other material in these areas. So don't hesitate to reach out to us if you'd like to learn more. Um, again, today really is, is what we're gonna focus on with, with manufacturing, but I just wanted to make sure we gave you an overview. And if you can go ahead and click next. Perfect, so with that overview and introduction, I'll pass it over to Andy Schaefer's who again is, is going to bring us through the rest of this presentation. Andy, off to you. Great, thanks, Dan. There's four sections to the presentation today. The first one focuses here on NXCAD. NXCAD is really the enabling technology that we're going to use to put together our integrated manufacturing environment. So first, I'm going to show you the powerful modeling features, the capabilities, the ease of use of NXCAD. Then we're going to cover PMI, product and manufacturing information, a technique for 
creating 3D annotations that describe everything that's important about your product and really pave the way to this integrated manufacturing. But then at that point, we've got our model done. We don't wanna just send copies of that file out all over the shop. We want to be able to track and make sure we keep a connection between our design and our manufacturing environment. And the core technology we're gonna use for that is wavelinking. So that's gonna be the, the last part of this first section here. Here's some rough geometry for a vein that would be used on a high viscous fluid impeller, something like maybe latex. When we start projects like this, usually we're not gonna uh, have a solid to start with. We're going to have individual surfaces. And as you can see, Andy, we may have lost you there for a sec. Here, the surfaces are not trimmed back. They're extending past their boundaries in several areas. So our first job is to make this a solid. Well, NX makes this very simple. There's a command here called combine, and it automatically trims the surfaces back and creates the solids. You'll see that here as I hide the sheet boundaries. And there's our solid to start our impeller design. Moving down the part navigator, we now see a series of surfaces which will form the web between the veins. Those surfaces come up tangent to the cylindrical hub. We need to turn them into a solid. NX has another technique for doing this called thicken, which just adds thickness to the surfaces it's given. At this point, we have three independent solids on the screen. NX allows us to model these independently and then unite them together when it makes sense for the modeling process. At this time then, I'll pattern the web and the vein around and that allows us to see the impeller in its almost completed state. Now it's time to place the blends on the part. NX easily handles complex blend intersections, blends with variable radii, even a blend that is tangent to three surfaces simultaneously. At this point, we'll move on to product manufacturing information, PMI. As we create our PMI annotations, they'll be added to one of the model views that you see here on the left side. That helps keep things organized and it lets you shift from one view to another quickly. To create these annotations here for the cylindrical features, we would probably prefer a section view. Let's create one now. This is the correct orientation for the section view. Now we'll just make sure it's centered up. And that's all that's needed then to create that section view. We see it added here to our models views. The next annotations we create will appear below that section view. Let's start with the lower diameter. and I'll lock it to the section plane. That's actually datum A, that cylinder. So let's create a datum feature symbol. We are creating semantic PMI, which means that the annotations we create are associated back to actual geometry on the part. So I'll select that feature now. Next, I'll place the annotation. And we see here that we have associativity not only to the feature, but also to the dimension. So if I drag the dimension, the annotation is moving also. Next, I'll dimension the cylindrical feature on the top. Because this feature is concentric to datum A, we could place now a feature control frame. As you look in the dialog, you'll see that when NX creates PMI annotations, it's not simply kicking out a bunch of symbols. Our dialogs understand the relationship to the geometry 
and the requirements for meeting the specifications for ANSI or ISO. So in this case, we'll, we have concentricity within a diametric tolerance of 0.05 millimeters, and our primary datum reference is A. Okay, now let's place a few more dimensions. Again, we're just locked on to the section, so it automatically places those in the correct plane. We can also place surface finish PMI annotations. Here I'll use a leader. Okay, that's the first view for our PMI annotations. Here I'm switching to a PMI view that I've already started. The dimensions have lots of options for modifiers, including tolerances or the creation of basic dimensions. Everything you would expect from a standard drafting system is available to you here in PMI and NX. As I mentioned earlier, it's very easy to switch from one PMI view to another. You just click on the model view that contains the PMI annotations you're interested in. One other thing I want to reiterate though, is the interrelationships between the PMI objects. Here we have a feature control frame and down here is the datum. Watch how the color of data may changes as I select the feature control frame. It turns green. That indicates then that this feature control frame is related to data may. It's a very nice demonstration of the interrelated aspects of our PMI dimensioning in NX. Now it's time to think about a manufacturing setup for our impeller, but we don't just want to send copies of this model out to each area of manufacturing that requires it. That makes it difficult to ensure everyone's working on the same revision, hard to keep track of the derivatives if a change is made. What we will do in NX is solve this problem with wavelinking. We will create an associative reference back to our authority part, sometimes called a master model, so that we know we're always working on the right revision. Here I'm just selecting the component. The wavelength is created for me in the background. But we can take this one step further with our wave linking tools. We can also link in the PMI annotations that were created back in that impeller model. The additional benefit that you have in wave linking these is that you can choose only the PMI dimensions that are relevant for the manufacturing process you are undertaking. In this case, we'll select only the datum on the bottom, which might be necessary for fixture creation, and then the diameter and feature control frame at the top controlling that dimension that we would want to check during manufacturing. Okay, Dan, I think we're ready for that first poll now. Great, thanks for that, Andy. Glad we uh, we really got to deep dive into the software. So as I mentioned, guys, this will be an interactive webinar and I'm launching just the first poll that we have. Um, and it relates to a little bit around what Andy was discussing. So what is your company's current position regarding the use of PMI? So that's product manufacturing information three simple options. One, we are using PMI now. 
two, we are using traditional paper drawings, or three, we are not using PMI, but we plan to in the future. Why don't you go ahead and, and take a couple minutes to just answer that. By a couple minutes, I mean 40 seconds. <laughs> yeah. And while they're going through that, Andy, we did have one question come in that I think would be helpful as you move forward with the presentation. Um, it was around what is the difference or how is NX different from Solid Edge? I think that might be helpful for some of the attendees as you go through the remainder of your presentation. Sure. Well, they're both owned by Siemens and they're both parasolid based, so they certainly share a lot of similarities. But when you really get down to it and look at the difference between the two products, you see that um, really NX is more of the enterprise product. We have the CAD CAM integrated. We have all these um, simulation tools that are integrated right into NX, whereas Solid Edge tends to be more of a, you know, on its own mid-range CAD system that you can then uh, work with third-party software with, but it's not all integrated in. You know, we could probably spend a, a whole hour, Dan, talking about all the differences, <laughs> but I think fundamentally the difference is if you're looking for that integrated environment, if you're thinking uh, more about systems and um, industry 4.0, NX is really the, mm -hmm. the vehicle that's going to get you there. Perfect. Very well said, Andy. And I agree, we could spend a whole hour, but it's it's uh, it's best if we just move forward at this point. I think just to just to answer, and I'm going to go ahead and close the poll at this point. Um, yeah, we we saw a pretty pretty even split in terms of those that are using PMI paper drawings or not using it at all. So I think I think either way, we're going to find that the upcoming part of the presentation will also be uh, educational as well as the earlier one. So back to you, Andy. Why don't you keep going ahead? Great. <clears throat> okay, now we're jumping into uh, the part of the demo where we discuss the, the functions and capabilities of NX CAM. And this first section here, we're going to focus on the operation types that we're going to create. We're going to continue with the same impeller model. We'll create a uh, stock for it, and then I'll show you, <clears throat> excuse me, fundamentally how we would machine this. We've got a couple of new technologies that we're going to introduce during this section. Uh, one we're really proud of are adaptive machining uh, that holds our chip thickness constant. It's got several key advantages for manufacturers and uh, new for us now is our ability to apply this technology to five axis machining. You'll also see how well we integrate turning and milling operations in together. Uh, it's important for these multi-function machines that are becoming more and more popular. Uh, we've got you covered there. So let's start the demo. I'm going to copy some geometry around in a radial pattern before I start programming here. I'm a little concerned about deformation or chatter that could occur on the outboard sides of those veins. So I've modeled a little tab that I'll use to prevent machining in those areas. That'll leave just a little connection there. Next, I'm going to let NX complete the stock for me. I'm going to use a command which automatically recognizes the extents, even of a complex shape like this, and presents me with a cylinder. And in this case, I have a one millimeter offset from all sides. I just pick the solid, the axes, and it creates the shape I need. We'll be programming this part on a turn mill. You're probably familiar with a mill turn, which looks more like a traditional horizontal lathe, but milling capabilities have been added to it. On a turn mill, it will look more like a regular trunnion five-axis milling machine, but in this case, the C-axis table can spin. Then we put a lathe turning tool into the spindle, and we can perform turning operations. That makes a lot of sense for us on our project because we can see a lot of material here that could be turned off on a lathe. But then the question is, how do we determine the profile that will be used for turning? 
we'll let NX create that profile for us automatically. We're currently looking at the geometry view in the Operation Navigator. The Operation Navigator is used for all of the relationships and objects we create in NX Cam. In the geometry view then, we're looking at relationships between our coordinate systems and objects like our workpiece. Here as I hit the torch, you'll see the part and then our blank highlight. We want to create that geometry profile for turning. I'll do that now. Its parent will be MCS turning. And there we have a profile for our part and a profile for the blank. So it understands the material to be machined is this area in between. Now that we have our spun profile, it's time to create our turning operation. I've got a template here. I'll drag and drop it down on top of the geometry. And that's all that's required for that operation to then inherit the geometry from up above. Let's edit the operation now and look at some of the options that are available to us for controlling this turning tool path. Now first, I'm going to be machining in this quadrant here. I might not want to have my turning tool come over the top and into this area. I can do that with a radial trim plane. NX helps me out here by giving me a preview of the tool so I can see exactly the point that I'm selecting. Now let's go to our approach and departure. And here we'll select a point which NX will start from. So here's a safe point where I'll begin my approach. We'll check the departure and again, I'll choose a direct departure and just say it's gonna be the same as the start. Okay, let's hit generate just to see what things look like right now. And that's actually a pretty good looking tool path. However, I can see it's going right to finish. So we're going to want to change that. There's a lot of granularity here in our ability to set different stock offsets. We can choose either face or a radial offset, or in my case, I'm just going to use a constant rough stock of half a millimeter. Following that same theme, let's go to the feeds and speeds, and we'll set our spindle speed. And I don't need to change any feed rates, but I do wanna show you that you have, again, a wide amount of control over how you're going to set the feed rates for different types of cuts that you would use in turning. Let's regenerate. And we've got a couple of ways here to validate the work we've done. First of all, we can see green is the area that's been removed by this operation. The tan area is the part and so yellow would be what is remaining as a result of this operation. Let's go to the uh, Verify tab here and we'll choose 3D Dynamic and do a quick simulation. Okay, that's what we're looking for. This solid then represents the stock remaining after that turning operation. We call this the in-process workpiece or IPW. NXCAM tracks this and passes it on to subsequent operations. As each operation removes material, that resulting IPW is passed to the next operation. We use this to minimize air cutting and to make sure that we don't have collisions of the tool with the stock. Before we start milling on this part, let's drill a hole through the the middle. We use hole making to create this feature. As we look at the templates that are available, you'll see many options that can be used to create different kinds of holes. We've got helical hole milling, tapping, and even back countersinking. For this operation though, we'll just use drilling. I've already got a tool selected, and now we'll select the geometry. Note that NX sees the entire hole with all concentric features. And when I 
come to the machining area, I can differentiate between those two. For instance, here, I, I don't want to drill through cylinder one. I want to drill through cylinder two. Now it's showing me the material that would be removed with the in-process feature that's uh, currently selected. Now, if I change from local here to use 3D, watch what will happen. It will understand that with the IPW, the material goes clear up to this point. And in fact, that's what we want. Here I'm generating that feature based on the settings that we've given it. And that completes our hole. Let's do just a quick verification here. And as we expected, it's going through the bottom with a small offset. Okay, now we'll move on to some milling here in this central area. We'll mill the center of this out using our adaptive milling operation type. This is a constant chip thickness technique. Our step over will be small, but our feed rate will be high and our spindle speed will be high. And this improves tool life and it also increases metal removal rates. We'll need a way to tell NX that we want to machine only the center area. The trim boundaries will do that for us. NX has some powerful capabilities for utilizing existing edges on your solid. This means you won't have to create sketches. Also, all the geometry is associative if changes are made. We'll choose to trim the outside and I'll specify a plane that I'd like to project all of these edges onto. Let's drag that up. And now I just need to select the curves. You can see as I make selections, the curves are being projected upwards. Note that the curves don't need to be actually connected. NX is making the connections for me when it does the projection. Okay, I think I've got just one more to select. And there's my completed curve. We will now generate using the attached tool. And we'll get a better look at how the adaptive milling accomplishes its goal of constant chip thickness. We see it using a, an efficient spiral type path out here where there are, are uh, no boundaries, but as it works its way into the corners, you see it returning with a rapid move and then re-engaging the cut, again, keeping that chip thickness constant. Something else that you might notice is typically this command would enter an area like this by doing a helix down in to remove the material where the tool needs to start. It's not present here because NX realizes from the in-process workpiece that there's actually no material there. It's already been drilled out so it knows it can wrap the tool right down to the start of the cut. To give you a better idea of how this toolpath works, let's run a 3D dynamic verification and display the toolpath also. First, you see the correct IPW with the turning and the drilling. The materials are removed there. Uh, here's our spiral, and now it gets a little more complex. You can see the motions that the operation is taking to keep that chip thickness constant. When you take a very thick cut with an end mill, you're going to have part of the chip that's thick and part of it that's just razor thin. That's a problem because that uh, will create a lot of heat, and that's what causes excess of tool wear. So our technique here is to run higher spindle speeds, higher feed rates, keep that chip thickness constant and give you higher throughput and your tools will last longer. Adaptive milling worked great for this area here that's completely open and could be machined using a constant tool axis. But what about roughing in between these veins? The problem is that not only must the axis be tipped, 
But as we work our way around, that axis keeps changing. We would like the capabilities of adaptive milling for the constant chip thickness, but we need a way to adapt our tool axis. NX has this capability, it's called multi-axis roughing. I've completed an operation here so you can see how this works. We'll use the 3D dynamic verification to show you what this toolpath does. It's a little subtle, but you can see the tool axis changing as it works side to side and moves its way up the vein. This toolpath has a lot of advantages over fixed axis roughing. Besides the additional tool life and the faster material removal, you can see that you won't have steps along the side of the wall, uh, which is what happens when you're running a traditional fixed axis roughing toolpath. Let's continue our discussion about finishing. These walls are a challenge because of the narrow distance between the two veins at this point. We'd like to use a large diameter ball end mill because that will allow us to have a wider spacing and still have small scallops. That's not a choice for us. So with a small ball end mill, the spacing between passes would have to be very tight to ensure a good finish and accuracy. There is a new tool that's available, and in NX we call it a tangent barrel tool. It's also sometimes known as a circle sector cutter. The way this tool works is, although it's small in diameter, it has this curve on the outside before you get to the end, which simulates a larger diameter cutter. For instance, this is a six millimeter diameter tool but it simulates the finish of a 95 millimeter tool. Let's look at how NX supports this newer technology. I've set this up with a tilt angle of 10.5 degrees, which means that the tool axis, as it approaches the angle of the wall, is off that wall by 10.5 degrees. And that's just enough to make sure that the contact with the wall is above the ball end, which is what I want for a good finish. At this point, let's hit 3D dynamic and look at the actual finish on the solid model. I'm going to just suppress the animation and hit fast forward. We don't need to see it work, we just wanna see the end result. Okay, that's a very nice finish there. Now we could hit the analyze button and measure that, but I think for purposes of our evaluation here, we can see that uh, the 10 passes has got us very close to a finish. And in fact, we are simulating the finish you'd achieve with a 95 millimeter ball. Great. Thank you for that, Andy. Are we ready for the second poll? Go ahead and share this. Andy, I'm gonna go ahead and share the second poll now. Does that work for you? That's, that's, that's time to do that. Thank you. Perfect. Great. So moving on. Have you looked at five axis machine tools or multi-function machines such as mill turns? And again, we have three options here. Firstly, we will purchase advanced CNC machines in the future. Second, our shop uses only conventional CNC equipment. Or third, we have already implemented advanced CNC equipment. If you wouldn't mind, just take another 30 seconds or so to uh, give us your insight on the poll. Perfect. And as, as for before, if you have questions as we're going through the presentation or any of the material presented, please don't hesitate to write them in the, in the question section. <clears throat> Great, we'll give it another 10 seconds or so. All right. 
excellent. Thank you all for taking the time to respond. <clears throat> so again, in relation to, to that poll, we're seeing that the majority of you have already implemented advanced CNC equipment, which is great. So what we're sharing will hopefully help resonate. Um, some of you have only conventional CNC equipment. So again, if, if you're looking at, at learning a little bit more about how to leverage that or, or working with advanced uh, machines, please don't hesitate to give us a shout. Um, and with that, I'm actually gonna pass it back to Andy. Andy, why don't you go ahead and continue your presentation? Thank you, Dan. We're going to transition now from understanding the CAM operations to validation, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of a program before we'd send it out to the shop floor. Now, what many companies are doing is just uh, scheduling time on the shop floor with a machine tool to try out new programs. And while this is certainly effective, it's not terribly efficient and it's expensive. Those, those machines cost a lot and we want them making chips, not sitting there as we run the program very slowly in the air to make sure everything's okay. So what we offer in NX is a true G-code based simulation, which means that the post-processor is creating the code and then our simulation engine is using that to create the motion on the screen exactly as it would appear out on the shop floor. Uh, we also do collision checking, uh, which is a great way to validate programs in that we can check against uh, not only your, your fixtures, but your tool against the stock, things like that. And we can set uh, clearance so that you can determine, you know, maybe you didn't get a hit, but maybe you got close to hitting. Uh, with that, again, I'll switch over and let's do the demonstration. Here's the component we'll be using to explore simulation. It's a manifold that will be machined from a billet. This will be used elsewhere on the pump. And our machine tool is a Haas UMC 750, which is a five axis trunnion machine. You'll note that the simulation environment for NXCAM is built right in. Many of our competitors use an external application. We believe it's important for programmers to be able to evaluate their operations as they create them. Let's look at some other tools that are available to us in simulation. Preview motion allows me to manually change the axis position of the machine tool while the setup is in place. So here you can see as I rotate, I can check for clearance with my entire setup and ensure that I'm not going to have problems it's much easier to identify problems here at the CAM system rather than out on the shop floor. You're watching a simulation in progress. Here in the execution view, you see G-code. The post-processor for the Haas is invoked in the background. It produces the G-code which goes into a buffer. The simulation machine reads that code and executes it, creates motion, just like the physical machine tool would. This style of simulation provides the best fidelity between the simulation technique and the physical machine tool. I currently have the tool trace turned on, which allows you to have a history of the tool's movement and is particularly useful for checking rapid motions. In this operation, we are simulating a dynamic work offset. Then we see the rotations come out and then the code to machine the feature. Our simulation environment understands not only the maximum velocity of joints like these rotaries, but also their maximum acceleration. This results in our cycle times being very accurate as compared to what you'll actually see on the shop floor. And there's our feature. We also have the capability to simulate existing G-code. In other words, G-code that's not being generated from the operations. It already exists on my hard drive. This is useful for situations where Perhaps you have a program that's been out on the shop floor for many years. You are trying to manage uncertainty to determine whether this is a good program or not. 
you can run it here in the simulator before you commit it to a physical machine tool. Additionally, you have some capabilities here with this G code. For instance, I can select a stop point and then just play and the simulator will go until it gets to that point and then wait for further instructions from me. You can also make edits right here as you're working on the program if you find something that needs to be fixed and then you can save it out later. It's a very useful capability. Now let's discuss the collision checking that's available in our simulation solution. It's a very important component for many of our customers. There's a lot of granularity here. We can check the tool against the IPW, that's the remaining stock, the tool against the part, or we can customize our collisions. We do this by setting up collision pairs. For instance, I can choose to check any tool against any setup element, which means the, the fixtures, and you see them there in, in uh, yellow. The collision clearance provides you with an additional capability, and this is often useful um, for checking collisions to tables, things where you don't want to know just did a hard hit occur. You can have it warn you if the two objects come within a certain collision clearance. You can have as many of these collision pairs as you want, and if you have a standard setup, you can save those settings here so that everyone is checking against a standard collision pair setup. Our simulation solution with collision checking then provides you with an important part of risk management in reducing your uncertainty to ensure that the programs you're sending to the shop floor are safe and efficient. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to go ahead and, and share the third poll now. So again, this is the second last of our polls, everyone. If, if you could just take two, 20 seconds to help us fill this out. Um, how does your company validate CNC programs? And this time we've got four options. We schedule tryout time on the machine tool. We are using an advanced simulation program now. We are using a non-G-code simulation in our CAM system, or we are considering G-code based simulation. So if you could just please take a few seconds and, and give us your insight, it's, it's going to help in terms of not just wrapping up the webinar here, but also uh, future material that we put out. Great. And just a quick time check of about 13 minutes left. Uh, we'll, we'll get through our, our final section. If there's additional questions, don't hesitate to to share those as well. I'm going to go ahead and, and close the poll at this point in time. seems like almost everybody here is using an advanced simulation program already, which is the second option. So good to hear. I think that lines up quite a bit with what we're seeing with the different clients that we're working with in industry. So with that, Andy, I'm just going to go ahead and pass it back to you. Great. Thanks, Dan. Well, our last topic for the day is work instructions. And this is a, an issue where work instructions are very important. We've got to put those together for the traveler we send out on the shop floor. We already ask a lot of our programmers and we find many, many companies where the programmers themselves are required to put together the information for those work instructions. And everyone's then looking for a solution. You know, How can we automate the creation of those work instructions so we can get our programmers back doing what they need to. And we've got a great solution for you. Uh, not only does it automate the, uh, the, the creation of the instructions, but uh, it allows you to customize so they're coming out in a standard format and we keep them associated so that when changes are made to the program, you just republish them and your uh, updated instructions are input. We'll do that demo now.
Let's demonstrate the work instructions in NXCAM. I have an existing program here and I can add my work instructions to the structure of this program. There are system generated instructions that are available, but you can also customize them. In this case, I'll begin with an operations list. So it prompts me then for a camera view because an image is going to be part of this list. So I'll choose this setting here as my camera. And then it needs to know which program. It's one, two, three, four. Additionally, I could put text in here, set up information or something like that. Now, beyond just that operations list, I could look at a specific operation and choose to add a work instruction that consists of special information just for this operation. For instance, here I might choose a image and that I'd like to display the tool at an important part of this uh, operation. Once I've created my work instructions then, all I need to do to create them is publish. In this case, let's do HTML. And you see it here in the background, creating all of the work instructions. Okay, here's my HTML file. And the first thing we see is the image we took and then a operations list of all the operations in this program. Then we have hot links to the image I took and a couple of other images that were already present as authored work instructions. One of the great benefits of work instructions is that they are associative. So if I made a change to one of these operations, I would not have to redo the work instruction. It remembers the camera position, so all I have to do is republish, and then I'm ready to send accurate, up-to-date work instructions out to the shop floor. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. I think with that, we're ready to wrap up, everyone. We just have our, our final poll to go ahead and share. Again, we appreciate everyone's insight so far. So how does your company produce setup information for your shop floor traveler? Option one, programmers are required to create this info manually. Option two, other employees create this information manually. Option three, we would like to automate the production of this info. So again, please take another 15 seconds or so. At this point, we're, we're approaching the end of the presentation. So if you had additional questions, this would be the, the right time to, to go ahead and ask them. Okay. And just as we're wrapping it up, I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll. Seems like a pretty even split between the majority of you that have programmers requiring to create this info or other employees. Um, not so much on, on having it automated, um, which, which again, a couple, I'd say some of the more leading edge orgs are, are starting to move more in, in, in that direction. Um, but either way, in, in terms of what we're seeing, it's, it's, it's something that I'd say would be more on the typical side. Andy, with that, I'll, I'll pass it up to you if you had any closing thoughts or points you wanted to bring up. Well, sure, we'll just do a quick review, Dan. So at the start, we showed NXCAD and the powerful capabilities that are available in NXCAD that really provide that enabling technology, the, the baseline for your industry 4.0 implementations. Then we went on and uh, did the next three sessions on the CAM environment. And basically there it's creating the operations, validating the operations, documenting them, and then um, maintenance, as changes are made, that really rolls back to the first topic, the wavelength link that we did that allows you then to make changes at the front end 
and see those changes roll through to the back end so you have confidence that uh, the stakeholders uh, involved in a change are aware and can efficiently update their files so you can keep going. That's it for our presentation today, Dan. Wonderful. Thank you so much there, Andy. Um, everyone, we, we appreciate your time. Again, if, if you have more questions, feel free to ask them um, towards the end of the present um, or, or email us and we'll get back to you. I think I see one coming in right now. While we have that, um, please note that we do have additional webinars that are ongoing at this point in time. So take a look at those. Um, a lot of those will be available as well in terms of what we see on our on our website. So please go ahead and, and, and take a look at those. Um, there is one question here, Andy, and now I'll pass it over to you. Does your does our CAM simulation support only Siemens controls? Yeah. Could well, you go ahead and answer right, that? Yeah, you know, yeah. NX is a, a Siemens product, right? So we, we certainly have a Siemens engine in our simulation, but we also have engines for mm -hmm. FANUC controls, Heidenhain controls, Okuma, and then a couple of others like uh, Haas or the Mitsubishi controls really are just derivatives of FANUC. So we, we can cover mm -hmm. any control that's out there in terms of true uh, machine code based simulation. Excellent. That's really good to hear. And and I think this is the last one we'll cover before wrapping up. Can can manufacturing integration with PMI still work if we send some of our work to outside shops? Could you address that one? Oh, oh sure. Now, um, there's probably a couple of ways that you can go. But in the last couple of years, we've seen the release of Step 242 as a standard that actually covers uh, semantic PMI. We have a translator available for NX. And so I would recommend that you then go out to your vendors and ask with their manufacturing software, do they have step 242 available? If so, then you've created the bridge and you can get that PMI information mm -hmm. out to your vendors. Wonderful. Andy, thank you so much for your answers and uh, the excellent presentation and demonstrations you showed today. Um, everyone else, on top of the webinars and, and the information we're going to send out, we do have a competition ongoing right now in terms of uh, ingenious trivia. You can find more information on our social media as well as our, our different uh, platforms, uh, including our website. It is up to $500 in prizes for the people who get the most trivia questions right. It's open to anyone and everyone. So please do take a look at that as well. Uh, you can also find it on our Twitter and LinkedIn over there. So take a look at that. We'll be sending out the recording and, and following up, as well as uh, letting you know if there's additional webinars that we think are of interest. Really appreciate you all spending the time with us today. Have a wonderful day, and uh, and we'll be in touch. Thank yes. you so much. Yes, Thanks, thank Andy. you.